So the guys from LinuxConf actually asked me to come and do a talk on OpenStack and maybe some infrastructure as a service and some Kubernetes and what the people are doing around what is happening in the industry. So it's quite amazing to see what the open source community has done in the l recent couple of years around how they can look at scaling workloads and also understanding what they can do with with networks and compute and storage. It's very fascinating to see what people are doing around these type of technologies and also what the new thing is around Kubernetes, what people are doing around Kubernetes. So really it's around who has played around with cloud services. So you guys have played around with cloud services, okay? Amazon, Azure, and Google Compute, and those type of things. But who's actually built a infrastructure locally? Okay, scaling with what type of technology? With OpenStack? Okay, from, from source or from a vendor? From source. Impressive, okay. So there's a lot of things that people do around OpenStack, what they can do around the specific components into it, especially when you start looking at building it from source, how do you basically have a capability of building HA stacks inside how the OpenStack framework actually works. So what is happening with SUSE is the fact that we're actually building and we're working very closely with the OpenStack Foundation. Alan Clark is the head of the OpenStack Foundation himself and we're giving quite a bit of direction with open s open stack frameworks and what we allow and what the the community actually wants to bring into the into the open stack framework it's quite amazing to see that the community is actually building open stack from a from a container point of view so the next releases what you will find from open stack is is not going to be built out of vms or bare metal you're actually going to spin up a Kubernetes framework, and from there you're going to spin out your compute, your storage, etc. It's very interesting to see what's happening. Now, also, if you look at how many projects is aligned in OpenStack, it is fascinating to see how the RESTful API can talk into all these different components of OpenStack. Now, I don't know want to know how long you've taken to build out OpenStack because I know it can take a bit of time. Hence the reason why SUSE and other vendors want to make life simpler and easier for you to actually deploy an OpenStack framework. And especially when you start looking at availability zones, that how you can cross-platform cross availability zones in HA stacks. So also what SUSE is doing around this is understanding how we're going to give back to the community. Now, there wasn't really an HA component with OpenStack. I'm not sure if you've seen how they're actually building it out because there's a lot of raw code that you have to bolt into it with HA proxy. We natively, we can build a control pane into a high available stack, which I will show you guys just now. Now there's multiple components what the people are looking at how they can build out an OpenStack framework, understanding what you want to do with it. Now, this is how we're looking at how we build out an OpenStack framework. Now, just a raise of hands, or maybe you can tell me, how many different projects is there in an OpenStack installation? No, you can't, you, because it's so many, okay? Because every time that I look at the OpenStack project, something new has come about, something new has come about. And it's quite fascinating to see how the community is just pushing into the OpenStack framework to understand how they can do things easier. Now, from a SUSE perspective, yes, we've got a lot of configuration management processes out there. For example, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, CO Engine, Salt. Now, we prefer having a component with a bunch of these things. As you can see, how we build out a framework is that we've got Chef that leads into Crowbar that can build out your, 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 your framework. Now what we've done is we've taken Ansible as well, and who knows what's going to be next? Because I don't know where the community is going to go, but, but the thing is with SUSE, we make sure whatever we put into the distribution or in OpenStack, we give you support for it. <coughs> Out of this, that you've got Crowbar, you've got your software mirrors, 
You've got TFTP that you can pre-boot pre your systems, okay? Now we've got configuration where you can actually go in ILO, boot the ILO boxes, and predefine the workloads that has to go onto it. Then we've got all these different things. Your database, your message queue, RabbitMQ. You've got the image store, you've got Cinder, Neutron. All those different components. We're bringing in new functionality with the likes of Cisco, with the likes of other hardware vendors to make sure that we can build out and scale an OpenStack framework. We've got clients that actually scale to 34,000 VMs on an OpenStack environment, okay? The cool thing what they do is they spin up and kill those instances in a matter of minutes because they want to do some specific testing around what they want to do in the environment. They spin up the 34,000 VMs, make sure the work is actually done, and they kill it. And that's what they do specifically with OpenStack. You can scale it out to a bunch of other new things. For example, what you can do with Ironic. Ironic, you can do bare metal provisioning within OpenStack. That workload is specifically designed for what's running on bare metal. So for example, if you want to run, let's say, um, databases in memory, or you want to run something specific on the hardware, the provisioning engine with Ironic can do that for you. Then also we've got a thing called Magnum that can scale with uh, um, Kubernetes within the OpenStack environment that you can have your virtual machines, your physical machines, and your, your containerization built into one platform. The cool thing about this is we can have multiple hypervisors built into it. If you want to run Zen, KVM, System Z, HVM, whatever. We've got ap open APIs talking to each one of these specific hardware vendors or software vendors as well. When you start looking at the high availability component, it's important to understand if your control pane goes down, you've got serious problems. Hence the reason when we start looking at Pacemaker, SUSE HA's Pacemaker, you can build out a three node or four node cluster to manage your control pane. Because if your networking goes down, your network goes with it. You guys agree, <laughs> okay? Hence the reason we make sure that all these things are in a high available nature when you build out your clusters. It's very, very important. So what is in SUSE so OpenStack Cloud? So there's a bunch of things. So we also look very closely what the community is doing. So if you look at, for example, how to back up your control pane. Can you back up your control pane out now? Okay. So if you've got a state, now it's important to understand, your control pane, let's say you have 34,000 VMs and you have to back it up somehow. How do you get that system operational again if something would go wrong? That's why we build in components. For example, specific on, let's say, we, how do we plug into EC2, okay? Here is Ironic, here is Magnum, here's your Keystone component that you can do, your specific components for identity, okay? Solometer, as you can see, Solometer is gonna be supported by Minosca or uh, with Prometheus. Who's heard of Prometheus? It's very cool, okay? So we are building out these components to make sure that the capability with the newest technology from open source comes back into a supported manner to make sure you've got the capabilities for these type of frameworks. So when you look at the supported platform, what's gonna happen in some of the projects, okay? So CLM, which, we sh which we're gonna build with Ansible now, is going to be Manila, Manaska, Manaska, Salometer. As you can see, these things are going to change as per what the <coughs> community is to going to go and build out their frameworks. We are solely dependable on what the community is doing, and we lead from what they are saying. We're going to drop this, we're going to bring this in. For example, Trove, we brought it into OpenStack. A lot of people say, yeah, okay, but the community doesn't want to work it anymore, so we're going to drop it. So if the community is going to diverse into something else, we'll bring that into the equation as well. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, you say that um, you quickly drop things when you don't use them, for example, Trove. Um, how long would you say it'll take you to bring something in that would replace it? It, depen typically? it depends on the community. Look, we'll, we'll have support for it, okay, for a period of time. 
until the community, if there's no commits onto, let's say, the Trove project, then there's no need for us to basically keep backporting it and things like that. But we'll keep support for a period of time, uh, depending on how quickly the community actually drops it. So if there's a new, let's say, for Sahara is the new database of choice that we're going to have, then you will basically have a migration plan that you have that you're moving from Trove over to, let's say, a Sahara platform or something like that. So we'll make sure that we don't uh, discontinue something that will keep on continuing building it out. So we'll have a process where we actually have a migration plan for you. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. So now, out of these things, these are the, the things that, that uh, OpenStack uh, gives you. VPN as a service, firewall as a service, uh, database as a service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what is happening is these are the new things. Sorry for the skewed thing, but there's a bunch of projects that's new and how we're going to build it out. For example, an app catalog that you're going to have into uh, OpenStack. Big data services. Now, big data services with our storage component, which is related to Ceph, how we can actually build that out, and we can have native integration with Ceph. Now, do you guys integrate your OpenStack framework with Ceph or with SAN? With Chef, okay? Block and object and file, or just block? Just block, okay? But with, uh, with what we have, we've got, we can uh, tie in with block, object, and file, how you can tie it in. We have clients that actually use Ceph specifically just for its components for redundancy on erasure coding and replication, or they can tie it into what we have with uh, SudoOpenStack Cloud. And then you can see all the things that's all already in full support. Now CAS, I'm going to talk about it just now, Container Service Platform that we have as a Kubernetes framework. So all these components are already in. Now we can actually look at how database as a service is going to be a new, and then if you look at our under evaluation, RevStack here, and all these things of Cola and OpenStack Ansible, are we going to bring it into the equation, yes or no? So we are evaluating it, and we're going to bring it into it and saying, here is a quick le look for you guys, what do you think about it? And then if every all, all our clients says, yeah, we like it, we'll basically put it into a blue component, or that we're going to support it because our clients tell us what they want to use it for and how they want to scale. So, in the section we've covered, we are quite key to understanding how we're going to drive the OpenStack framework, what is going to be needed, how we're going to drive it, what the community wants from us, and we give back. So from the give back capability is saying, how do we build out an HA framework on OpenStack, how do we do certain things? And what is the value to you that you have a backported support process that you can upgrade, that it nothing actually breaks? Because <laughs> I know a lot of companies come to us and say, so listen, we've got an OpenStack framework, we need to upgrade from version A to version B. How do we do it? If you want to do it from, from source, some hair raising and late nights, However, from our, su our support pl uh, process, we've actually tested it and made sure because there's so many moving parts. If you do one thing wrong on the one side, you won't be able to see your data because if you, all your VMs are sitting in your, in, your, in your safe cluster and something's wrong on Neutron, how are you going to fix it? You have to fix it yourself. Whereby with us, we make sure that the support process is done for you. Then we've got this beautiful thing called heat. Have you guys played with heat? So, so. Okay, so heat is very cool. So what is heat? So heat is a template, it's a YAML file that you can decide what you want to deploy. A lot of people in the OpenStack framework goes into Horizon, build a machine, M1 small, M1 medium, M1 large, and they build the machine out. But you can build different availability zones with OpenStack and the cool thing with heat templates is the fact that you can take a heat template, you say, I want to have a LAMP stack, my Linux box can do this, my PHP box can do this, my Apache box can do this, my database can do this. Do you want to put it in one box or different machines? How do you want to build it out? Now, and you can build that into a HA stack as well with heat templates. With heat template, you put all the configuration into one template file, and you say heat, command, deploy. 
and it will talk to the relevant APIs to go and build it out for you. You don't have to worry about a thing because your templatized process is already predefined for you and you just scale. And if you want to have in your template five machines or 100, you decide on how quickly you want to scale. And with a heat template, you can actually go and spin it up and kill it in a matter of seconds. So that comes back into your CI CD framework of saying, what do I want to do? And that is on VMs. And we're not going to even talk about that right now of what you can do with containers within it. Because with containers, a matter of building a container versus an image, it's chalk and cheese. Because the one, and you can tie the two in. So if you build out your VMs and your containerization can talk in back into your VMs, you can scale both at the same time with open uh, with through open stack cloud. And that brings us into the software defined infrastructure. Because a lot of people look at it and saying, what is software defined infrastructure? That is going to be your compute, your networking, and your storage, all bundled into one. Now, us geeks, we need to make sure that we understand all three of those parameters. And understanding those parameters builds into how the key template, understanding how your floating IP is going to be defined, how your machines are going to talk across pl uh, platforms, how your machines are going to cross talk about DMZs and your firewalls. We'll need to make sure that we can actually tie all of that into a heat template. But it can be quite tricky. And it's very tricky to understand how we can do certain things like patterns, understanding how patterns are going to build into your environment. Companies come to us and say, we're going to build uh, um, a, a DMZ for certain machines, and we're going to have availability zones for certain machines, and we're going to have a firewall for certain machines. And we can templatize it with a, a heat template to understand how you want to build out your orchestration methods. You don't have to be tied into anything specifically because this can be versatile for how you want to build it out. So just quickly in summary, we work very closely with the community and we can actually build out lots of components. And if you look at your, your process day by day, what is it what you want to do? So if you build out your environment only on VMs, maybe this next six, the next day you want to say, you know what, maybe we should look at Magnum, understanding how we can build out Kubernetes frameworks. What is the what we want to do? So, so the OpenStack is very, very flexible of understanding how you can build out certain workloads. So just to give you a quick idea of what SUSE OpenStack and CES is. So we've spoken about SUSE OpenStack, but what are we going to do with Ceph? So this is the roadmap for Ceph. <laughs> it's quite amazing to see how Ceph has evolved or what's, what's happening in the environment, okay? So as you can see, We've got lots of uh, components to tie it into, understanding, because at the moment we just released Ceph 5.5. I think it's maybe about two weeks old now. And uh, we've actually integrated into Ceph's understanding how we can do non-RBD components right in straight into the back end of uh, Ceph cluster. Because a lot of people don't want to use gateways. They want to talk straight into the RBD component and they make sure that they've got the performance relation components. And then also understanding how Blue Store can actually help you up your IOs onto your Ceph cluster. Because there's a lot of things that people want to do and they want to reach out and to understand how we can increase our Ceph performance. And then if you guys want to start talking about SSDs, NVMEs, how your crush map is going to work and your journals, how they're going to be tied in. Blue Store actually helps understanding how we can get to those stages where you can maybe look at tier one type of performance of how you can look from a tier two, we can play very well there. But if you go into tier one, understanding how the machine should behave and how we can give you the IOPS that you need to require a sense the standalone uh, Ceph cluster or tie it into RBD with SUSE OpenStack Cloud. It's very cool to do this because we've got clients running five to eight petabytes raw in the Ceph cluster. It's quite big. And they're using, uh, they're not using erosion coding, they're using um, replication. Some clients want to basically save on disk and run erosion coding. It depends what you want to do. But we've got all the capabilities for you to do those type of things. So that gives you an idea of what we can do around OpenStack and Ceph. But I'm quite 
eagerly to understand how people start using containers. Are you guys toying with that idea of running application containers? Have you built containers? And is it working for you? So, so, okay. Because really the, the, the idea around containers is to bring development into a stateful, stateless type of scenario, okay? A stateful is to understand how you're gonna build your containers and keep data there, or you're gonna send it somewhere else. And this is pretty cool of understanding how we can actually build out containers. So what is a container? So you can actually say it's a package image that's running independently from anything else you've got. It's an image that you can scale at any given time. But you need to f have a framework. So you can actually go and do a Docker pull, Docker run, and have one instance of it. But is it what you want to do? Because containers really come into the fore of understanding scale. How do you scale the environment? So just to put you an idea of what it is. So you've got a hypervisor, you've got a VM, and a VM, and a VM, and a VM. However, yes, with heat templates, you can actually scale your VMs. But each VM needs to have an application on it. You need to go and configure it. You need to patch it, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, you can go and kill it. You can, you can have the CI, CD component. However, with the combination between the two, when you're starting to look at containerization and you can push your stateful components into a VM, or you don't need to. You can put your stateful components straight into a container is all dependable of how you want to basically build your environment and how quickly you want to go to market. And if you go to market and there's something wrong with the code, how do you deal with it? What are you going to do about it? Do you go and say, do we change the code or do we patch it? Or do we say, dev guys, please just look at the code, fix it quickly, and then swap over between, between production and what's gone wrong. And this is pretty cool because in the whole process of your CIDC, C CI, uh, CD component of continuous delivery is how we actually help companies to come into the into the full. So building out, and also the nice thing about this whole process is, where do you get your containers from? Do you build it yourself, or do you go and do a Docker pull? That's the question that we always ask clients. If you want to do a Docker pull, what code is in it? Yes, it's already predefined. You've got a lamp stack. You've got a bunch of things already in it but can you trust the code that's in there? That is the question you have to ask. Yes, it's quick to go and do because most of the work is done. However, in this whole process, we can give you capability that you can build your own containers, make sure that it's vetted by the company. You've got your own registry. Sure, you can push certain things into your Google registry or into Docker registry, that's fine if you trust whoever's gonna use it. If you don't wanna do it, we've got your own registry built into the whole platform that you can actually trust the code that you're gonna put into it. And this is how we can actually help you. How do we build it? So let's go quickly into a POC type environment. So if you look at traditional processes from a development, building code, building the application, where it is, how long life cycle is that, versus what you got in the container. Because you don't necessarily always have the framework to go and build out a VM. Maybe you don't have resources, because how long does it take you to build a VM? Sometimes because you need to wait for disk, you need to make, make sure that you've got um, X amount of hard hardware available for your VMs to run, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where we actually help companies to decide what they want to do from a traditional point of view. A traditional point of view is saying, you plan, you code, you build, you test, release, deploy, and operate. That could be how long? Six months? Easily. How quickly do companies come to a fore of saying, how long did it take us to fail? Sometimes it takes years with lots of money. And then how do you scale to any type of platform? Sometimes it's difficult. But with containerization, you're allowed to basically scale to anything. What do you want to do? How, do you want to go to actually have people only on a website? Do you want to basically put it into an application? Because everything is containerized. Because if you look at flatbacks, how people actually build applications that you can just spin up at any given time. You don't even have to have a Docker engine. You don't have to have a uh, platform. The application can be run directly off your laptop, whatever that is. And this is what where we are. And this helps you to decide how quickly we can succeed and fail. 
is very important because when you plan code, build, test, deploy, and operate, how quickly is this? And this is where we drive to understand how open source incumbent this whole process. And bringing it in saying, understanding how we can bring it into different hypervisors, bringing container runtime run, run environments. So, without containers, you have to go and set up certain things. You need to go and speak to your network guys. You need to speak to your storage guys. You need to, need to, need to, need to. With microservices, you don't necessarily have to because you've got everything already predefined, pre-planned. All you need to do is understanding what the business requirements are, understanding how do I want to bring in my CI, CD. That is very important for us to understand how we can give you a robust system to make sure that we can incumbent all those things for you. So, ease of application deployment. Really, it is up to you, the business. Decide what you want to do, where you want to go and play. Because each one of these, so if you look at your pub public cloud vendors, they've also got a Kubernetes framework, okay? You've got your physical service, you can run Kubernetes on top of that. Your private cloud, you've just seen that we can actually spin up Magnum within your OpenStack environment seamlessly. And I promise you, we can actually have a SUSE OpenStack uh, platform running within a day. If you've got all the mechanisms in play, we can actually have it running in a day with no problems whatsoever. And then you can tie in your virtual machines if you choose to. And then how does the containers actually tie into your whole bigger scheme of plans? So why? Because a lot of people are looking at it. Really, a lot of people are looking at it because of the robustness and the ease of use and simplified deployment of containers in a platform. So you can run, so 27 people are running it right now today, okay, that we've actually spoken to. Then this is what we have spoken to, 44% of people want to run it within a year, and then planning to run it in the next couple of years. So it's a quite compelling process that people looking at understanding how they want to really have a more agile approach to the data centers. Because people want to go to Azure, want to go to Amazon, want to go to Google. But why not do it for your internal cloud as well? Because a lot of people look at the static processes, what you don't really need. Because really, you can actually have an agile process around SUSE OpenStack Cloud. And how do you scale? It's very important to say, understand how do you scale and how do you provision. Because now you can have a platform where you can actually have your developers tie straight into your, cl your platform and say, we give you this, these wor workloads. Because within your aggregators within OpenStack Cloud, you give them X amount of machines, you say how much you need. You actually provision the machines and you have it available there. And then what they can do whatever they want with it. If they want to have more resources, then you have an internal billing structure or something and say, we can buy a new server if you're running out of space and you add it to it. So you can be forewarned of understanding how these people want to start con consuming your hardware. So out of this, it actually enables more people to do more things around your OpenStack platform because it actually helps you to look at what do we need to do managing the environment or do we have to fix it? What is it what we want to do? So rather give the APIs to your development platform guys and say, do whatever you need to do, I'll monitor the system. And as they need to have hardware, networking, software, whatever, you put the catalogs in place. Out of that whole process, you make sure that the system is operational, understanding how you can actually help your business to get quicker into how they can actually make money. So the three key benefits is achieve faster time to value. Your business comes to you and say, we want to try and do this. How long does it take you right now to get that to, to them? Whatever that is. Because maybe they say, we want to run it on a, on a container platform. Do you have the capability? Yes, no. Out of this whole process, we can give that to you. We can give you everything that, th that, that the company needs for you as an IT professional and the business. Simplify management. 
because we've got a very simplified manage to install your, 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 your clusters, to install your uh, hypervisors, to install your container framework, and checking it into a registry. We've got all that already predefined, pre-planned. You have just to basically build it out and plan it. It takes more time to plan it than actually installing it. <laughs> okay? And then also, if you look at complete graduating platform in, in implementation, holistic security, those are the things that we're actually looking at from a cloud platform, that you focus on the things that's important. Because there's lots of times that people neglect security just to get something out. And that's a big problem. Because if you build your security measures and people want to do something quickly, they can't. But out of this, you've got a security framework around everything that you need, plus you are very agile and you can do things much quicker. So how is it look like? So three components is We've got the micro OS, you've got Kubernetes, and you've got your, con uh, your container engine, and we're building it out with salt. Now look at this, what we are doing. We've got Chef, Ansible, and we've got salt, built into our management portfolio, because we are the open, open source company, because we're not saying that that, that should basically be de facto. We are saying, what do the companies want to do? And we help and organize and process these things that companies want to do because we don't know where you want to be and we have to fit in with what you want to basically achieve. That is our motto. And then also SUSE Micro OS is optimized for large deployments. So we're not saying that you have to scale it to 20 machines. We're really saying scale it to thousands. That is what we are saying we can do. And then runs on Kubernetes, of course, understanding how you can deploy, manage, and scale, and it's clustered. So you can have multiple masters running on Magnum in SUSE so OpenStack Cloud. You can run independently if you choose to, but you can actually integrate it as well. Yes, Kubernetes by deployment is not easy, but that's why we make it easier for you so who actually wants to make you guys have seen how difficult it is to, to deploy an OpenStack framework? But now you're adding different namespaces and Kubernetes to build it from source. Sometimes can get a bit challenging. And that's why we're making sure that your security is not neglected. We make it easier for you to deploy it. And we make sure that anybody can actually deploy it. So how it works is, We've got container execution, your data center in integration, okay? How do you want to integrate into it? Then you've got your Kubernetes, where you can actually say, with kubectl commands, you can actually scale to hundreds of thousands of containers. It's a simple process. Or if you like to have a GUI, then you can just click on the workload and scale it. We can actually put algorithms in play of saying that depending on the business needs of the flow, let's say for example in November time frame, you can see the, the workloads on Apache web servers are actually taking up, then what you do is you decommission some workloads, but you don't switch it off. You decommission, you scale it down, you scale up the other ones. So that these things take, let's say, second priority, and as December comes into play, you've got full stack of basically making sure that you can scale to the nth degree, but the other workloads still can work. But as it actually comes down, so you can have a nice flow of how your machine should behave, and you never have to get anything, you have to never switch anything off to make sure that you've got availability on resources. And then we've got this beautiful thing called Helm Charts. Have you, of, have you guys heard of Helm Charts? So companies actually build code into Helm Charts so that you can actually do a Helm install of a certain code into a container, and then it actually pulls the container according to from your registry of how you want to build out Helm. So a Helm and kubectl is two different things. So kubectl manages your cluster resources, and Helm actually helps you to build out your cluster resources in containers. And then with your kubectl, you can actually scale your, your, your container frameworks. And that's already pre-built, pre-planned, pre-everything into our CAS platform. 
Any questions? And then, how does it work? So, you've got your admin node, and you've got a couple of masters. Your masters, which we actually defined as salt master, and then salt minion. So all these boxes, the worker nodes, you can have thousands of these worker nodes running around in your cluster, okay, in your OpenStack framework. So these babies, the, the masters, will manage how the deployment of each container actually goes and sits on the worker nodes. And then any of these worker nodes can die. Who cares? Because these masters will know how to scale the other nodes according to if any of the other nodes actually will fail. And we've got a specific deployment of how you can actually, how many masters for how many worker nodes you need to make sure that they can actually balance the workloads accordingly. And that is my song and dance. And I think I've got maybe about, what, two, three minutes left. Any questions? Sure. I didn't get most of what was happening there. <laughs> okay. I'm new to all of this. So, like, if I wanted to maybe set up a, I don't know, internet cafe, is this in any way relevant to what I want to do? N not, not necessarily. Well, depends. If you've got an internet cafe and you've got, let's say, some services, and that's a beautiful thing about what you can do with, with technology like this. So if you've got an internet cafe and you want to basically say, as the guys log on and you've got a web portal where you can buy stuff, okay, then this makes, makes, makes logical sense. Because now, if you look at what Netflix are doing and so forth, everything is scaled onto, onto Kubernetes uh, platform, okay, or container platform as a matter. So let's say, for example, you open an um, internet cafe, you can build a bunch of Linux machines, and then they can basically start using your internet services. Out of the internet services, you can have a web portal where people can actually buy stuff from you. That stuff that you actually sell to them can sit on a Kubernetes framework if it's sitting in Amazon, Azure, on your on-prem, wherever you want to do. Swap your credit card and they can purchase the stuff. So if you want to build it from that perspective, Internet Cafe, you don't need it if you're not going to have a catalog of stuff to go and sell. So if you want to start building it into that platform, yes. If you're going to build your LAMP stacks, et cetera, onto this, you can do that. If you want to build your Internet Cafe on SUSE Linux itself, you can do that as well. Okay. Cool. Um, you're saying that there's uh, projects out there to containerize deploying OpenStack instead of going through the pain of from source. Um, do you have some names of the like the reference uh, open source projects and the names of the projects in SUS that we can maybe have a look at and read up on? Um, the idea around um, what the community is doing is to make it much simpler to actually manage the control pane. If you go back into this and you put your control plane onto the worker nodes, okay? And then let's say Neutron and those type of things sits on that platform. At the moment, we're looking at how we're going to build that out on the understanding, how we're going to build out the master work codes and so forth, because it's important to understand how these things are going to basically be available. Now, it makes logical sense to put your control plane onto a, a Kubernetes platform so that it's always available, that you don't have to worry about how your VMs and your physical box is going to basically do the HA capability. We are looking at it maybe in the next release or the following release. Uh, I just heard that we are looking at it. If I get some information and you guys want to share your details with me, I'll keep you abreast of how far we are with it. And because we've got a lot of beta programs, so sign up onto the beta programs. So you sign up on the beta programs, you've got the code, you can do everything and you can play with it, understanding where you want to be. And you can give us feedback as well in saying, we don't like this, we like this, we do this, we do that. And we can actually give you feedback of where we are with the projects, and then you can tell us how you find how the projects actually evolve with you. So please sign up as a beta program. Um, my email address is johan.els at suzy.com. If you guys want to basically be on the beta program, please tell me. I'll put you on the beta program. Start playing with it. And that is from SUSE Manager, Salt, uh, Sleep 15, HPC, High Performance Computing, whatever you guys want to play with. Uh, we've got to be the program that you can start playing with it. If you like it, then we can actually chat about wha how you can implement it. Okay. 
Any more questions? Thank you. You wanted to. Hey, so I'm just trying to wrap my head around what containers are, actually. Um, so I heard you, you mentioned flat pack. I've, I've seen how that works. It's basic encapsulation with a program. And you, I think you mentioned something like it's, could it be like an OS itself as well that you wrap in within like Kubernetes, Kubernetes? Or yeah, so just to put you back into this. We've got a micro OS, yeah. which is based on SUSE. And in that, we basically put the containers on top of it. The containers can be running any type of other distribution out there. So it could be an Ubuntu, could be, could be, could be. However, if you pull a container from Docker Hub, okay, that could be a CentOS box, could be something else. We don't know what that is until you actually go and do a Docker run on the, on the application if you're going to start the application in it. So those things, we need to understand what the security process is for you to bring that into your organization. That's very important. What code is in that container? Within this process, we can actually have the capability with SUSE Manager build out your own container platform based on SUSE to put application stacks inside the container. And that container can be stateful, stateless. So to decide on what the, what the development guys want to do, if it's a stateless component, they can at any given time make a mistake on their code, kill it, redeploy it. They don't have to go and fix it. That's the whole idea about CICD, is to understand how quickly you can fail and how quickly you can succeed. And gi we give you the platform to accomplish those tasks. So you can really put anything into a container. It depends on what that use case is going to be for. Okay. Thanks, Johan. Um, I think it's time for lunch. So.